Todd, I, w- I want to talk to you a little bit about um, ETF concentration. So for a while <laughs> last week, we saw some of these uh, gaming ETFs like GAMR uh, all of a sudden have numbers that were crazy because uh, GameStop became a significant weighting in them. Can you very briefly explain ETFs don't want this to happen. So they have ways of limiting these kinds of problems. They have ways of, uh, for example, rebalancing, mostly on a quarterly basis. Can you, without getting too far in the weeds, just explain how rebalancing uh, works and what would, what's the natural process here to make sure GameStop doesn't, doesn't dominate ETFs that it's in? ETFs in general are diversified and diversified at not only the industry level, but also the security level. And so when a stock goes up tenfold uh, within a very short period of time, the weighting uh, can often go up quite sharply and almost as much as as tenfold. So uh, in Gamer, G-A-M-R, the ETF uh, that you referenced, the video game ETF, GameStop was over a 25% position in XRT, which is the spider retail ETF. It was over 20%. And you can obviously see the impact of that if it is not rebalanced faster than the quarterly. And that's what these ETFs tend to be rebalanced quarterly. We have GameStop down today, which is impacting negatively those respective ETFs that have a heavy weighting. And an ETF that doesn't have any exposure to GameStop, for example, Hero, which is Global X's video game ETF, is up on the day, even though Gamer, G-A-M-R, is down on the day because GameStop is driving it. So when an ETF is not rebalanced and the weighting is 20 percent, you can obviously have the tail wagging the dog. Yeah. Yeah. the, so I think the key point here is, isn't there, under the 40 Act, isn't it prohibited to have a weighting of more than 25% for any particular security in the ETF? I'm not sure if I remember that, but somewhere in my in the foggy areas of my brain, I seem to remember that as a requirement for the 40 Act. And you can't have, um, more, no more than a certain group of companies can only make up, I think it's over half of the portfolio can only be made up of uh, 5% of the companies uh, at, at some point. I'm getting a little mixed up in in that, but there are limits. There are actual limits on how much you can actually have in these. Correct, Todd? There, there are limits to it, and so it seems reasonable that if we don't see, and we are seeing a pullback, obviously in GameStop today, so that may solve the problem itself. Uh, but we could, you know, the index providers behind these ETFs have the discretion to rebalance uh, faster than on a quarterly basis, and if we saw a position remain as large as over 20 percent coming close to breaking that rule, we would certainly see uh, the asset manager and the index provider step in. I just This has happened so quickly, yeah. uh, and, and the ETF hasn't caught up with, with the change in the stock price. Yeah. Dan, I want to turn to you. You are a managing director of uh, behavioral financing and investment at Betterment. We've talked to you many times about, about the behavioral investing aspects of all of this. What does behavioral finance, first off, Briefly, tell us what behavioral finance does. I I love it because it basically purports to describe how people really act, not how they're supposed to act rationally. But tell us what behavioral finance is and what does it have to teach us about this whole Reddit GameStop episode? I think you uh, you hit the nail on the head there. It's not about um, how the smartest person in the world or the best economist in the world makes decisions. It's about how ordinary people make decisions. And the ramifications of that for markets and for people like me who look to advise ordinary people. And what, so go a little further down the the rabbit hole on this. What, What is it, what did you see happening here with the, Betterment with the Reddit behavior? Um, Did it confirm everything you always understood about behavioral economics? Um, uh, Did it have confirmed confirmation bias uh, or or something like that? What what happened here that is illustrative of behavioral uh, economics? Or was there anything unusual about this in terms of what your understanding of the discipline is? One of the it brings up a lot of the longstanding features of human psychology when it comes to investing. I think the thing that's different this time is how uh, how technology has amplified certain aspects to it. So there's a lot of underlying things leading to the current mania. The first one, which is very interesting, is commission free trading. 
there is a small amount of psychology literature that looks at how people understand free as being fundamentally different than something that costs a penny or five cents. We treat it fundamentally differently in that we overconsume those things. We're thoughtless about it. We go in and we're like, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll try this thing, no problem. Uh, a second component to it is that we're in the, a pandemic where we are socially isolated from one another. A lot of our social interactions are happening through screens. We have a lot more time if we're working from home or if we're unemployed working from home to spend time on those screens looking for connection through message boards, through tribes of people like us. And there's a neat sort of participation sport component to that feeling now where if you gang up with enough other people and focus on one specific thing, you can actually move the share price of these publicly listed companies. Um, I think there's a, yeah. another element. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, finish your book. I think there's a, an element that we're hitting on now, which is that um, a lot of this is also sort of social network driven and novelty driven. And as we're already seeing, it's very hard to have a stock remain in the spotlight as the novelty thing is the thing that's going up 200 percent day over day over day. Um, attention from these message boards tends to wander to new to something else. And that's bad from the sort of squeeze perce uh, perception in that they want it focused on one thing. As we see attention drift away from game stock to silver and then to other things, a little bit of the pressure comes out of the bag. So um, we're already seeing that tendency to look for novelty and to what's next to fracture away the attention that was focused on one thing for yeah. so long. Yeah. And I, I, I think that's a very good point. For, first, you're Overconsumption based on free commissions is a really good point. People tend to use stuff more when it's free. And of course, it's not free. They do sell the order flow. They don't quite understand it, but it, it, does, it appears to be uh, free. Um, of course, we get back to the, I had to live through and report on the chat rooms in the 90s. I was still the, real, the uh, stocks correspondent even then. Um, and would you agree that it's the same, but it's not the same as the chat rooms? The chat rooms help pump up stocks and yet the gamification of trading, the intensity of the social media situation, the free commissions, all that kind of combines. So it, the, the, the behavioral economics part, the brain chemistry part is virtually the same. And yet the, me the medium is, is amped up, hyper, uh, uh, hyper amped up in a way. So I'm trying to say it seems like this is the same, but it's different at the same time. Does that make sense? Yeah, it sort of feels like uh, the markets are all in a vodka Red Bull. You need the uh, the Red Bull for the energy <laughs> and the intensity better than and the I vodka for the questionable judgment. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. Um, let me, uh, Stephen, let me just turn to you and get your thoughts on this, too. And feel free to, everybody, feel free to jump in at this point. I've got five, four very smart people here. You're the CEO of um, uh, Q.AI. This is an AI-driven investment platform, folks. You spent a lot of time surveying uh, the Reddit crowd and the Facebook investment crowd, I, I guess as part of your, uh, your way of setting up uh, this particular platform, you spoke to several thousand of them or, in, or surveyed them. What did you find out about them? What, what do they need and, 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 and what do they want? Yeah, Bob, thanks for having me on the show today. We actually spoke to a couple thousand people, um, both through Reddit, Instagram, and through Facebook to really understand the problems they're facing today. I mean, a lot of the feedback we were getting was product offerings are limited. They can't tell the difference between different products. They don't have access to the best of class managers. And really the problem set that we started to crystallize around was that people had trouble focusing on how to cut losses and to take profits. How do they actually build a diversified portfolios with different stocks and ETFs? And how to trade the current market environment, which is increasingly more volatile. You know, we talked about the Reddit movement. We've been really active in Reddit now for four or five years. I don't think this is a fad. Now, is this a movement? Well, it's been occurring for the last seven to eight years. So I don't know if you'd call it a movement right now. There has been a secular movement to digital finan financial investing tools from traditional finance over that period of time. It's definitively countercultural, in my opinion, as you see this movement to decentralized online communities where people are learning from each other. It's quite fascinating. You know, we're talking about the Wall Street Bets community. It's got 7.9 million right. users. But what about the stocks community? It's got nearly 2 million. If you talk about the Facebook stock market group for 2021, it's already north of 170K. So these movements, yeah. these online communities are growing exponentially. I can rattle off a few more that we're active in on Reddit. Well, it, it, look, look, I want to just sort of channel this a little bit more. And guys, feel free to jump in if you want to say something. 
you, you say it's definitely countercultural. I, I would agree with that. I guess the longer term question is what happens here? How do you, I think this is wonderful. I, I have been worried for years and years about the concentration of wealth in the stock market. We all know, we use these statistics all the time, the top 10% of households by net worth control 87% of the stock market worth, the top 20% control 94%. Essentially, you know, the top 10% control the majority of the stock market wealth of households by net worth. Uh, and how do you expand that? And now we have a younger bunch of people. A lot of this is COVID related. They're home. They're getting stimulus tap checks. Who cares? I'm in favor of them coming in. I guess the question is, how do you channel all of this? They're not going to go rampaging around screaming um, for years and years and years. The question is, how do you corral is not the right word. How do you turn them into long term investors, Stephen? How, they're not going to go out and, you know, uh, call up Vanguard and open a mutual fund next month. OK, I understand that. But what else are they going to do? We, we have these ways where you are helping people set up uh, mutual funds on, on their own from uh, separately managed accounts, SMAs. Is it, Tell us where these people are going to go. Are they going to end up with their own separately managed accounts and become regular investors? Or are they going to get blown out and blown up and leave and be angry and bitter? Or, what, what, or is it a little bit of both? Yeah, I actually think there's a secular shift towards the SMA structure. I mean, with us, especially based on the research we've done before we launched our robo-investment manager, there's been a, a focus on people moving away from stocks and ETFs to building portfolios, building themes. For us, we see the SMAs as the future. And let me tell you why, because we're really talking about the millennial demographic who's going to experience a massive wealth transfer over the next decade. SMAs will permit bespoke solutions. You can personalize it. You can tailor it. Now, you and I, Bob, could invest in our global macro strategy, right, which is kind of built off what Bridgewater does. But you may want to tweak it in a certain way that fits your, your goals, whereas I may want to tilt it in another direction. And you can now do that with quantitative techniques as well as AI. And for this group, that, to me, that means that's the future, right? Because, again, it's customer-centric with a focus on how they're perceiving value. I think too often the finance industry really focuses on the value add we're delivering to the user as opposed to focusing on what the user really wants as a value. And I think that's going to lead to yeah. more empathetic, Dan, con consumer-centric approach. Yeah. Dan, weigh, weigh in on this. You're, this is in your wheelhouse uh, as well. Um, separate, for, for those of you who don't know the jargon, uh, He's referring to SMAs as separately managed accounts. Dan, is, is there a future in separately managed accounts? And what, what's your thoughts on, on where this crowd is going to go? Or is it too diverse to make generalizations? Yeah, I wanted to come back to that original question because I think it's very important. I'm worried we're going to see two sort of barbelled outcomes from people who have gotten involved in this. One is the successful people who hopefully are going to end up in an unusual position of either they made a large gain and they cashed out and they're going to have a tax bill that they're going to owe at some point in the future. And I hope they keep enough money and they've got money to meet that tax bill. But they've been in a single position stock and it might be very hard for them to move from saying, oh, I can pick winners. I can pick out, you know, a portfolio of max four or five stocks and do well at it. Um, so the first thing is they'll have developed a sense of high confidence that they'll be able to do this on an ongoing basis. The second, which again is successful, is they'll realize that they're going to owe very high capital gains taxes if they sell out at short term um, or still pretty significant at long term. And they end up stuck in that stock, waiting for it to be worth less or the tax rates to be lower. Um, and they're in a very concentrated portfolio for a long period of time. That's the people who did well in this. I'm also worried about, you know, part yeah. of this movement has been about, oh, the stock market is rigged. Ordinary people can't do well at it. I think ordinary people have been doing very well in sort of index or passive investing <laughs> for years by avoiding high cost, by avoiding concentration. There are going to be people who now say, no, I, I went in. I was part of this movement and I ended up just losing money and I'm never, never going near it again. And for the rest of their lives, these people are yeah. going to hold their money in savings accounts. They're going to say the stock market is too risky or you can't trust it. It's corrupt. And they're going to miss out on sort of the core economic engine of growth over the rest of their lives that could have helped them with their retirement savings. Yeah, Todd, I, one of the things I do not understand is, is one of the, the, the theses uh, of these people, uh, of, of the Reddit people, and they're all, they're all like I said, I'm very happy to have them, is we've been disrespected, we've been left out, we're not getting in on this. I, I just don't understand it because anyone who has put $1,000 in an S&P 500 index fund for the last 10 years has made a fortune. 
Um, the little guy has not been left out at all from any of this. There, there is no nefarious plan, and the average investor has done fabulously well. Now, you can say, well, I don't have any money to put in, but that's a different kind of problem than saying I'm actively getting getting screwed by everybody. Is, is there a way to kind of make that blatantly obvious point to everybody? Well, we talked about free. You know, you can get S&P 500 index ETFs for just three basis points from iShares from Vanguard and from State Street, you get the benefits of diversification. You can actually get an ETF for free uh, from Bank of New York Mellon and a couple other firms and get that diversification. So the con American consumer, the American investor, has never been in a better place to participate in the ongoing bull market. Um, and I think that ETFs offer a great solution to those folks. You're obviously not going to see a thousand percent returns in the individual ETF within a week or two weeks time. But slowly building up a nest egg uh, has worked for many investors using S&P based ETFs. Yeah. Todd, I just want to uh, come back to you briefly since you're the commodities uh, guy here. Uh, I know today that ETFs not just associated with silver are up, ETFs associated with platinum are up, uranium are, is up, copper ETFs are on the upside. Uh, you know, there's a big macro question here about whether there is going to be commodity supply uh, inflation that's going on. People have argued for years uh, that we've been underinvested under invested in commodities for a long time. Uh, it, it, is there a point, independent of the Reddit crowd, is there a, a point to be made about why commodity prices should be higher? So absolutely. I mean, for the first time, I think this could be the start of a new commodity super cycle. And the real reason behind that is, you know, for the last, uh, well, for the last sort of decade or so, um, you've seen a massive divergence between, you know, the stock market and the commodity markets. And one of the things that the pandemic's done is it's had a big effect on supply of commodities into the market because some of the worst affected companies um, in term or areas of the market from the pandemic have been the traditional commodity heavy sectors, particularly sectors like energy. And so, you know, the effect of that has been, you know, firms cutting back on, on production, um, firms consolidating, uh, doing what they can to try and uh, manage their way through the crisis. On top of that, you've got a Biden administration uh, now obviously uh, in place um, with a strong, uh, strong environmental uh, remit that we think will make or bring significant change uh, within the industry going forward. And so I think coupled with the recovery, you've now got a position where, you know, commodity prices have real legitimate reason to be rising right now. And as you rightly said, Bob, I mean, we're seeing today, we're seeing action in you know, broad commodity ETFs, uh, in platinum and gold um, all across the board. And for the first time, it looks like sort of concentrated buying. And again, you know, obviously the Reddit will take the headlines, silver will take the headlines. But I think this could be the start of a new bull cycle for commodities. Nothing like asking a commodities guy whether he thinks commodities are going up. <laughs> That's your answer, folks. <laughs>